I'm B.J. Clark, and it is a privilege to be a guest speaker here on Light From Above. And we appreciate so much your watching the program. What is the shortest verse in the English Bible? It is John 11:35. Jesus wept. Probably not as many know the shortest verse in the Greek New Testament, which is 1 Thessalonians 5:16. Rejoice evermore. Interesting. The shortest verse in the English Bible is about weeping. The shortest verse in the Greek New Testament is about rejoicing. And really, that's what life is pretty much all about. There are moments of great joy. There are moments of weeping and sorrow. Now, we're not the only ones who've ever experienced such. And as a matter of fact, I want you to be aware of this truth that's very encouraging. Jesus Christ wants you and He wants me to have a life that is overflowing with joy. I can prove this to you. In your Bible, in John chapter 15, we read of a conversation that Jesus had with His apostles on the night in which He was betrayed. The Bible tells us in John 15, 11 that Jesus spoke these words. He said, These things have I spoken unto you. Why? Why did you speak them, Lord? that my joy, yes, Jesus was joyful, might remain in you, and that your joy, he said, might be full, bubbling over is the literal term. So not only does Jesus want you to be joyful, he wants you to have a joy that is bubbling over, that uh, is full. In fact, it's fascinating to me that on uh, the pages of 1 John chapter 1, we read a statement that brings us all the way back to John 15 and the statement we've just read from Jesus. The same man that wrote the Gospel of John wrote the epistle of 1 John. And it's interesting, he gives us throughout this epistle why he wrote, I'm writing you for this reason. These things write unto you for this reason. And in the very first chapter, in verse 4, this is what we find in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4. He said, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Now where had he ever heard that before? He'd heard those very words come from the lips of our Lord on the night Jesus was betrayed, John 15, 11. And so he's writing his readers and says, we want you to have a joy, not just a joy, but a joy that is full and bubbling over and overflowing. Now what's the rational way to get that? You see, some people think you can get that kind of joy just by willing it to be so, by saying, I'm just going to be a positive person. And it's true, a positive attitude does lend itself to being more joyful. But the source of this joy is really found in Philippians chapter 4, where the Bible tells us what the Apostle Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Now we live in a time when people are miserable about many things and I don't know if you're facing certain things in your life right now that are really troubling you. It might be the, the case that someone watching this is saying, okay, you say rejoice always, rejoice evermore, but you don't understand what's going on in my life. If you knew what was going on in my life, you wouldn't be standing there saying rejoice in the Lord always and rejoice evermore. Don't you know, preacher, that I just got a report back from the doctor that said I have cancer and it's malignant and it's very aggressive? How am I supposed to rejoice when that's going on in my life? Preacher, do you know that when I got married, I thought it would be for life. I really meant it. I thought my mate did too. But they've left me. I'm lonely. I'm shattered. My heart is breaking and aching. And I'm supposed to rejoice. Brother Clark, when I was going to work every day, I always thought this job would be mine. They handed me my pink slip last week saying, we're done. You'll have to find some other source of income. We no longer need you. 
and I'm supposed to rejoice. Have you not seen the latest economic indicators of what's going on with the costs of things? Someone else might say, look, I have a loved one fighting overseas, and every time the phone rings, every time the doorbell rings, I think, oh no, is this the time when I'm going to be greeted with the most dreadful news possible, and I'm supposed to rejoice? When I had children that were small, they were always in services, and we took them every time the doors were open. And they grew up, and they met someone that was worldly-minded and not spiritually-minded, and they don't go to church anymore. And I'm supposed to rejoice, even though my children have completely left the Lord, if they ever knew Him to begin with. I don't know if I've even touched on the thing that you might be dealing with, but I do know this. My Bible tells me that there is a joy to be found in Christ that will dispel all the gloom, despair, and agony. When I was a boy growing up, the television show Hee Haw was popular, and there used to be a song, Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery, and if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. I know some people who live their lives with that philosophy. Ask them how they're doing, and it will always be gloom, despair, and agony. It's always deep, dark depression, excessive misery. There's never a time when the glass is even close to half full. It's always almost empty. Yet the Apostle Paul, when he said, Rejoice in the Lord always, where was he when he wrote that? Prison, under arrest. He wasn't free to just come and go as he pleased. And yet he's able to say, Rejoice in the Lord always, even when times are tough? Yes, he practiced what he preached. And you know the apostles in Acts 5 were told, Don't you dare preach in the name of Jesus of Nazareth anymore if you do. We're going to make you pay the price. Well, they kept, they kept preaching the resurrected Lord. And next thing you know, they were beaten in Acts chapter 5 and verse 40. And then verse 41, they departed from the presence of the council doing what? Whining, whimpering, saying, how could you let this happen to us, Lord, after we've been so faithful? No. They departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted word that had suffered shame for his name and they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ they went from house to house telling it Acts 5 41 and 42 and so you say okay you've said the Bible commands me to rejoice but can you give me any good reasons for it uh, fortunately the best sermon outlines you could find are the ones embedded right there in the text. And in the same passage in which Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, he gave us three reasons for doing so, at least three. Notice the first. It's found actually in the verse leading into Philippians 4.4. Philippians 4.3, I entreat thee also true yoke fellow, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, now watch this part here, whose names are in the book of life, and then what? Rejoice. Now interesting, he says their names are in the book of life, and the very next word you read is rejoice. Is that an accident, or is that intentional? I'd invite your attention to Luke 10 to show you the uh, intentional connection here. It's not some accidental connection. In fact, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus has sent out the 70. And the Bible says they return from their mission, how? With joy. Now, what's the basis of their joy? Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And Jesus said, I know, I, I saw you exercise power over Satan, but notwithstanding in this, rejoice not, he said in verse 20. But this is Jesus talking, but rather rejoice because, why? Because your names are written in heaven. Here's Luke 10, 19 and 20. 
Here's Philippians 4, 3 and 4. Luke 10, 19. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice. That's the way the Bible puts it. And so if you're watching this and you're in the Lord, you can rejoice no matter what else is going on in your life. You can rejoice. And we encourage you to do that very thing. Now, let's talk about how to get into the Lord because if you don't know that, you've missed it. How important is it for your name to be in the book of life and for you to be in the Lord? Well, all spiritual blessings are in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ, Romans 8, 1. And uh, my Bible tells me eternal life is in His Son, 1 John 5, 11. And so what's the significance of my name being in the book of life? Well, Revelation 20 answers that. In Revelation chapter 20, remember the book of Revelation is about what John saw. John, what did you see in this chapter? Well, among other things, he saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. And then he says in verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books, plural, were open. And another book, singular, was open. That's the book of life. He tells us that. The dead are judged out of the things written in the books. Now, what are these books? One commentary suggested that, well, this is uh, the books containing the record of our deeds. I have an issue with that. An almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent God does not have to consult His books to know what I've done or haven't done. On the day of judgment, He's not going to look at me and say, name, please, and then look up my deeds after I've told him who I am. He knows who I am. And he knows what I've done. He doesn't have to write things down to remember them. I've grown to an age now where I do have to write things down to remember them. And I've discovered a new problem. I lose the slip of paper I wrote it down on. Maybe some of you can identify with this problem. God doesn't have to write it down. Well, if he's not checking books on the day of judgment that tell what we did or what we didn't do what books might be the measuring stick oh wait a minute john 12 48 the word that christ has spoken will judge men in the last day where would you go to find the words that christ has spoken you'd find them in the books of holy scripture so whether my name's in the book of life depends on whether i've done what's in the books of holy scripture now as you read this, what happens if my name's not in the book of life? Verse 15, whosoever was not found written in the book of life is all right anyway. No, was cast into the lake of fire. That's still in the Bible, friend, and it still needs to be taught. Do you know there's a passage in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5 that is significant? You first need to become a member of the church by being baptized into Christ. And then once you get into the Lord as a penitent confessing believer, baptized into Jesus Christ, you're a member of the church that belongs to Christ. And then you're supposed to remain faithful as a member of that local church until you die in Christ. Now in Revelation 3, the church at Sardis had a name that they were alive, but really they're dead. They only appeared to be alive. They were on life support. He says, you have a few names in Sardis, verse 4 of Revelation 3, that have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, they're worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I'll confess his name before my father and before his angels. Uh, Brother Johnny Ramsey was a preacher of days gone by. He's already passed on to his reward but he used to summarize the book of Revelation by saying the message of the book is that if you overcome, you may come over and live with me. And that's what John is telling them, Jesus is telling them through John's inspired pen that that's uh, their situation. And incidentally, I do need to stop long enough to notice this. Have you ever heard this doctrine of once saved, always saved? Well, once you're saved, you're always saved. You can never lose your salvation. We're told that by so many religious-minded folk. And if you and I ever try to point out to these folks sinful lifestyle and say, you're telling me? 
that someone can live this wicked way and still be saved? What's the usual quibble that we hear back in response to that? Well, that just proves they were never really saved to begin with, is what we're told. Brother Guy in Woods, used to, also a preacher of yesteryear, used to say there are 2,500 passages in the Bible that show you could lose your salvation if you choose to, but uh, how many would you need to dismantle the once saved, always saved argument? Even one would be enough, wouldn't it? And I'll tell you why I go to Revelation 3, 5. It effectively demolishes the, oh, well, that just proves they were never really saved to begin with argument. Because think about it with me, friend. In order for a name to be blotted out of the book of life, what? It would first have to be in the book of life. How did it get there? Who put it there? That's God's domain. I don't have anything to say about whose name gets in and whose name doesn't. You don't either. But God does. Are you telling me? That God's going to look at a name in the book of life and say, oops, I don't guess I should have put that there after all. That's blasphemy. If a name was ever put in the book of life, it means the person was saved or God would not have put it there. And if then the name is blotted out after they're saved, they're now lost and not saved anymore. But here's the good news. That doesn't have to happen to you. Your name can get in the book of life and remain in the book of life. And that's what we want to happen. The eunuch came up out of the watery grave of baptism and went on his way rejoicing. Acts chapter 8. But you know what? So did Demas. Mm -hmm. Demas was baptized. He no doubt went on his way rejoicing that his sins were forgiven. But what happened to Demas? Paul wrote of him and said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. And so, it's not enough to start the race. You've got to finish it. David, did you ever know the joy of salvation? Yes. What happened to you, David? I, I pursued Bathsheba. I murdered her husband to cover up my transgressions. And then he says as he weeps and writes Psalm 51, Restore unto me, what? The joy of thy salvation. And so it may be, for all I know, that some watching this program have already obeyed the New Testament gospel plan of salvation, of hearing the Word of God and believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. For if you don't believe that, you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. And uh, some have already repented, perhaps, as all men everywhere have been commanded to do, Acts 17, 30. And maybe you've made the good confession like the eunuch did in Acts 8. And you've said, you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. And you've confessed unto in the direction of salvation, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And then maybe you have been baptized into Christ. That's in the Lord. Galatians 3, 27 says that's how you put Him on. We're baptized into the death of Christ, Romans 6 and verse 23 says, uh, that the wages of sin is death. But Romans 6 and verse 3 says that when you're baptized into Christ, you've been baptized into His death. And that is where you can enjoy the blessings of eternal life. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you haven't been baptized, you haven't been one who's entered into Christ Based on Paul's own writing, that didn't come from B.J. Clark. I'm nobody. But Paul was inspired, and what he wrote are the commandments of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37. Now, having said that, let me say this to you. Two other quick observations as to why you can rejoice today. Number one, if your name's in the book of life, if you've been baptized into Christ, into the Lord, and you've remained faithful... You have a reason to rejoice today. Number two, verse 5 of Philippians 4 says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. What does that mean? Well, again, the commentaries can get mixed up. <laughs> One man said, Paul thought erroneously that the second coming of Christ was about to happen at any moment. So he said, the Lord's at hand. No, he didn't. He didn't think that. He wrote by inspiration. He wasn't just writing down his human opinion about things. 
No, what did Paul mean when he said the Lord is at hand? He meant the Lord is nearby. When you were growing up and you were sick and mama tucked you in and gave you whatever she forced down your throat to make you better and she walks away, she might have said something like this to you. Now, honey, if you need anything at all, what? I'm right here. How encouraging was that to know the nearness of someone that cared so much? Friends, as I live my life and you live yours, there are going to be tough times. There are going to be tough times. I need the Savior to walk by me figuratively. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Lo, I'm with you always, lead to me being able to rejoice in the Lord always. And so to know he's nearby, what an encouragement. Some years ago we went to one of those caverns where they get you down inside and they turn all the lights out to show you how dark, dark can really be. Our toddler, Daniel at the time, was not fond of this stunt. And when they turned the lights out, he started shrieking, wailing. It wasn't hard to find him even in the dark. Just follow the piercing sound and reach for it. And that's where he was. I picked him up. And I patted him, and I just started talking to him. And he heard my voice, and he felt my arms enveloping him. And even though it was still dark, he started to calm down. Why? It's still dark. Well, it is still dark, but as long as my Father is with me, I'll be okay. And you know, the Lord's not going to pick us up miraculously in His arms and speak to us in a still small voice in the night, by a still small voice in the night, no. But He is still there providentially. And to know that the Lord is near fills me with cheer, makes me rejoice. And then there's this final point, verse 6 of Philippians 4. The Bible says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your request be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing is the way the King James renders it. It really means don't be filled with anxiety about anything. It's so encouraging to know that though I can't call the President of the United States anytime I get a notion, I can't get the world leaders on the line anytime I want to talk to them, I can talk to someone even more powerful anytime I want to. I can talk to the Father and pray to Him through Christ His Son and access his ear any time of day. I like telling the story about the CEO who said to his secretary, I am swamped, hold my calls, cancel my appointments, I can't take another one. Here comes someone dropping by to visit and the secretary shields him, won't let him in. Here's a multimillionaire from across town calling, I'm sorry he's not available. Can I take a message and when would be the best time for him to call you back? But then there's a tiny knock on the door that tiny knock causes that businessman to bolt out of his executive business chair. He knows that knock. He goes over to the door and opens it up. And he looks down because that's what he expects. Sure enough, his three-year-old son standing there with his arms up like this, pick me up, Daddy. And he picks up that boy and sits down and smothers his cheeks with soft fatherly kisses. Now you tell me, how did a three-year-old gain access to a man that multi-millionaires couldn't touch? Sonship. That's my child. And I'm always going to be there for my child. Friends, if you're God's child, He'll be there for you. If you're not God's child, friends, where do you think joy is going to be found outside of Christ? It can't be. We would encourage you to take this message so seriously so that you can live so joyfully because if your name's in the book of life and you know the Lord is near and you know the Lord will hear, you have reasons to rejoice and we encourage you to consider the plan of salvation now. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. 
For example, some people have been given wrong terms. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the terms, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind too that in Noah's day there was a big flood and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. Yeah.